Listen now to the word of God from Romans chapter 1. This is from Eugene Peterson's translation, The Message. I, Paul, am a devoted slave of Jesus Christ on assignment, authorized as an apostle to proclaim God's words and acts. I write this letter to all the Christians in Rome, God's friends. The sacred writings contain preliminary reports from the prophets on God's Son. His descent from David roots him in history. His unique identity as the Son of God was shown by the Spirit when Jesus was raised from the dead, setting him apart as the Messiah, our Master. Through him, we received both the generous gift of his life and the urgent task of passing it on to others who receive it by entering into obedient trust in Jesus. You are who you are through his gift and through his call. And I greet you now with all the generosity of God our Father and our Master, Jesus, the Messiah. Sisters and brothers, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now guys, most of us can look to one or more influential people in our lives who played an important role on who we have become. For me, that person is my father. Josh took this picture of me a couple weeks ago when we were out hiking in Panther Town Valley. And uh, when I look at that picture, it's just like I'm looking into the face of my, my father. I've had that happen to me several times before when I'm looking in a mirror and it looks like my dad is looking back at me. And the older I get, the more prominent that resemblance becomes. When I'm around my cousins now, they'll say, you really are beginning to look like your dad used to look. And for some reason, when I looked at that picture for the first time after Josh took it, it just struck me. I am my father's son. The more I look at that picture, the more I realize how influential my dad has been over my life and the life of my family. This is dad and mom and their family back in 1965, and three of the boys had come along by then. I am the one that dad is holding up uh, there in the picture. This was in uh, Salem, Virginia, when he was pastoring a, a Methodist church up there, and he probably had, his, had me corralled because he knew I'd be running off uh, if he didn't keep me uh, in his arms. But the more I look at those pictures, the more I realize that Dad's influence has played a major role on just about every important decision I have ever made. I blame my dad uh, for my love of automobiles. I love to tinker on an old car, and Dad was bitten by the same bug, and at least in my case, the apple didn't fall far from the tree. But Dad taught me a lot of important things, not just about cars. Dad showed me how to be a good man, a man of integrity. He taught me to never compromise the truth. Don't compromise when you know you're right. Don't sacrifice your integrity. Always tell the truth right up front and take your lumps as they come because in the end, truth will always win out. Now, I have not lived up to that advice my entire life, but I embrace it as the truth. My dad taught me what to look for uh, in a spouse. He showed me how to be a good father and a good husband. But most of all, my dad showed me what it looked like to be a follower of Jesus. He spent his life sacrificing himself for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of others that he ministered to. Dad had a powerful will about him. He had a determined spirit. Sometimes when I was a teenager, I thought he was just downright stubborn because he would never give an inch when he knew he was right. But when he stood before Jesus, the only thing I saw in my dad was faith and humility and gratitude 
and most of all, obedience. Guys, that's what I'm indebted to my Father mostly for today. I am who I am in Christ because of his witness. Now here at the beginning of Paul's letter to the Romans, he makes an incredible claim about this man called Jesus. The message translates verse 6 like this. You are who you are through the gift and the call of Christ Jesus. Now, guys, for a man with Paul's background to say something like that is truly unprecedented. You see, Paul had a Jewish, peril, a Jewish pedigree that was unparalleled. He stood out among his peers as having a perfect background. He had a perfect education. He had perfect dedication to all the Jewish traditions. And the first priority of that Jewish tradition says that you are who you are because of your heritage. The law and the traditions of your ancestors, those are the things that are, at, that are at the core of your identity as a person. So for Paul to replace that tradition and the law with Jesus was a radical statement. Something incredible had happened to change Paul's perspective. And that's one of the big reasons that the early Jewish Christians had problems with Paul's message about Jesus. They had a problem putting Jesus at the center of their lives instead of their traditions. And some something huge had to happen for Paul to make that step. I mean, he was completely, 100% committed uh, to his way of life. And then that encounter with Jesus happened on the road to Damascus, and his life changed forever. Guys, after that encounter with the risen Christ, Paul was a different person. His identity no longer came from what he had learned about his past. His identity came because he'd become a new creation in Jesus, and it brought him, it drew him into his future. Well, that change in who a person is, that change in who a person becomes when they decide to follow Jesus, that's what we're going to focus on today. Back when I was a teenager, we used to sing a song every summer at youth camp that went like this. Some of you might know this song. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Now that song had several more verses. And the last one went something like this. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. I don't think I really understood what I was singing about like back then. I know I didn't. I'm not sure about some of the other kids. But guys, that song, it planted a seed in my heart. A, a seed that stayed latent for a long, long time. But eventually it began to sprout and grow. And now some 45 years after I learned that song, I think I finally am beginning to grasp what it means to follow Jesus. When we make that decision to follow it changes who we are. Jesus causes us to look at the world. He causes us to look at our families, at our jobs, at the decisions we make with a set of new eyes, from a new set of values, from the standpoint of having a changed identity. And today, we're going to let Paul teach us how that change happens. How does following Jesus as Lord and King change the very essence of who we are? Well, Paul gives us the answer to that question over the next 16 chapters or so in Romans. But today, I want us to look at that answer in two parts. First, Paul says we begin to change when we realize that Jesus isn't like any other king 
that we have ever seen, any other person that we've ever seen. You see, the only king that the Romans had ever known was Caesar. Caesar was the emperor of the Roman Empire, and he only knew one way to rule. That was by dominion. The Roman Empire had invaded all the different countries around the Mediterranean, and when they would invade your country, they weren't fooling around. They robbed, they oppressed, they took from the people. They pretty much destroyed the culture and the lives of the people that they ruled over. And so when Paul begins his letter to the Romans with uh, the words, Paul, I am a slave of Christ Jesus, no matter who read that letter, the first thing they're thinking is, wait a minute, the last thing we need is another oppressor, another Caesar. But then, as they continue to read and they listen to Paul describe this man called Jesus, they begin to see this Jesus isn't like any other king that we've ever known. Jesus rules over his subjects in love. He's not motivated by self-gain. Jesus is motivated by self-giving. And when the people began to learn that, it was enough to grab their attention. The more that they heard about Jesus, the more they realized Jesus is not a heartless tyrant. Jesus is a loving Savior. He didn't come to oppress us. He came to enrich us, to show us what human life is supposed to be about. Over in the 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel, Jesus is trying to teach his disciples who he really is. And he says to them, you know that kings and tyrants in this world, they lord it over people beneath them. But among my disciples, it's got to be quite different. You see, a couple of Jesus' disciples had come to him and said, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, what we want you to do is let one of us sit at your right hand and one of us sit at your left hand. And Jesus says to them, you got it all wrong. Whoever wants to be a leader among you my disciples must first be a servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the servant of all. For even I, the Son of Man, came here not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Guys, that kind of king, a king whose heart is ruled by pure goodness and holy love. That's the kind of king everybody can follow. And that leads us up to the second thing that Paul wants us to see today. How does following Jesus as Lord change the very essence of who we are as we realize who Jesus really is, that he really does care for us? When we see and experience his sacrificial love for us, we learn to trust Jesus. We learn that his wisdom is much more reliable and trustworthy than anything that we could ever produce on our own. I love the New Living Translation here where it says verse 6 like this, Dear friends, you are among those who have been called to belong to Christ Jesus. Called to belong to Christ Jesus. You belong in God's family. God loves you dearly, and he has called you to be his very own people. Guys, that paints the picture of a God that no, nobody in that time had ever experienced. It paints the picture of a God that is so dramatically different than anything that we can ever experience out there in the world. And everything Paul writes about God's heart, from here on out, it comes back to this very truth. God loves us with a never-ending love, a love that is passionate, a love that will pursue you to the ends of the earth to save you, willing to sacrifice everything for your good. That's who God is. And that's the kind of God that we can trust. When we begin to experience that sacrificial love in our communion with Christ, it helps us to see that this man, Jesus, he's got something that we need and that his way is much better, much wiser than our way. 
Got to tell you one more story about my daddy. I'll always remember the first automobile accident I ever had. It was out in front of West Caldwell High School. My dad and I had found an old beater and bought it, and we'd begun to fix it up, uh, put new parts on it, and uh, I went and wrecked it like a couple years after I got the car. Well, I was turning left out onto Highway 18, right in front of the school's entrance, in a hurry to get wherever I was going. All I remember is that I couldn't wait to get out of that parking lot and get on the road. Well, you can guess where that attitude got me. In my haste, I ended up pulling out too quickly, turning left, and I clipped the back quarter panel of a car that was turning left in front of me with my front fender, and so it was my fault. I knew it was my fault. Didn't even need the policeman to tell me it was my fault. But all I could hear when that policeman was talking to me was the voice of my father telling me, Jim, when you're driving, you got to be patient. Most accidents happen because people are in too big of a rush to get where they're going. Well, back then, Lenore was a small community, and most everybody knew everybody else. Everybody knew my dad was the Methodist preacher. And the first words out of that policeman's mouth when he recognized who I was was, Son, you need to call your father. Well, I didn't really want to call my daddy because I was going to have to admit to him that I had done the exact thing he warned me not to do, but I didn't have a choice. And so I called my dad, and when he arrived, the first thing he asked me was, are you all right? And when he found out I was okay, he went and talked to the officer, and when he learned it was my fault, the only thing he said to me was this, son, Sometimes you have to learn the hard way. He was recognizing the fact he, that, that he had had to learn the hard way too and admitting that to me. He didn't rant about how he had told me exactly the same thing, don't get in such a hurry. He didn't even raise his voice. He just took care of the damages with the lady that I had wrecked her car, told me I could work it out a little bit at the time, and then he took me home. Guys, that day I learned a lot more from my dad other than just patience. I learned that I could trust him. I learned that my father's ways were a lot better than mine, that he knew a whole lot better than I did what was best for me. And beloved, when we learn that same lesson about God, that's a huge turning point on our discipleship journey. There was another song that came to my mind as I was writing this week. It's an old, old gospel song that goes like this. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace, to trust him more. Guys, if you will let Jesus, he will inspire that same kind of trust in you that Paul had, that my dad had, that I have, and that you can have. Give him the gift of your heart. Trust his ways above your own as we bow before him in prayer right now. Father, I thank you that we are not who we used to be. I thank you that because of Jesus, we can be a new creation. And I thank you today, oh God, for your faithfulness. Your faithfulness to the task of showing us day by day who we really are. Father, we know that the greatest desire of your heart is to prove to us that we can trust you, that we can follow you, that we can belong to you. So today, O oh Lord, we rededicate our lives to honoring your faithfulness, and we ask only that you give us grace for the journey, that your spirit would accompany us as we seek to become the new creation you have called us to be. We are who we are. We're becoming who we're becoming because of Jesus. 
In his name we pray.